Ross and I were making decisions about whether or not to move in together, and Myra had shared this piece of data, which is that couples that live together before they get married have higher divorce rates. And that was really counterintuitive to us. It was surprising. Abby, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm so glad to be here. And I quite often try and pick a common thread that makes authors write the books that they write, but the reasons change so, so often. And I'm wondering what inspired you to start researching and then, of course, now writing in the world of decision making? Well, the inspiration for the book was absolutely the course that my co-author taught at Stanford Business School for almost 50 years. But when I was in my early and mid-20s, before I took the class, like so many people, I had a really hard time making big decisions. I was trying to decide things like, should I move across the country to live in a city that I've always wanted to, even if I don't have a job offer there? Is that irresponsible? Or should I, uh, how do I know if the person that I'm dating is the one and, and you know, should we take our relationship to the next level? And how do we decide that? Um, so all of these big life decisions were coming at me. I was muddling through the best that I could, uh, but I never really felt like I was approaching them in a way that made sense or that I, you know, had trusted or had confidence in. And so it's kind of like if they went well, if they turned out in the positive way, that was a good decision. And if they went sideways, I thought, oh, that was a bad decision. But when I got to business school and I took my co-authors class, I realized, oh, it was like this light bulb moment. The reason that these decisions are so challenging is that the conventional wisdom is that we should really separate money decisions, career decisions from love decisions. We should make financial decisions with our heads and analyze them and not let our emotions interfere. And we should make relationship love decisions with our hearts and not let financial matters get in the way. That's, that's materialistic, right? And what Myra taught is that all of life's big decisions have a component of money and a component of love. They're profoundly intertwined. And if you try to separate them, you are more likely to make a decision that you regret that doesn't take into account the whole picture. And once I learned that and had the opportunity to take the class with someone I was dating at the time, and we applied that way of thinking to the way we were approaching the big life decisions we were making at the time about looking for jobs in the same city after we graduated, moving in together. It made all of those decisions that I had really struggled with early in my life so much easier to make, so much more clear in terms of the way to approach them. And it gave me so much more confidence in the decisions that I did make. I love that part of your story where your partner and yourself went on to a course around decision making. And I wonder how much more successful our decision making would be across the board if we did these things with our loved ones and kind of took them on the same journey or same path as, as, as ourselves. I think it was such a gift that we had the opportunity to do that. And I absolutely attribute it to so much of our success over now the past 14 years. So spoiler alert, we did move in together. We did get married. We have two kids. We've made lots of job changes along the way, um, lots of decisions about moving or not moving. And we absolutely have a shared framework, shared vocabulary, and a shared approach because we had this formative experience at just the right time in our relationship. And so part of the inspiration, so my husband and I had, had taken the class together. We then were in touch with our professor and she invited us back to be guest speakers for about a decade. And we had stayed in touch. And one day I had lunch with her when she retired in 2018 and she said, I want to write a book about the class. And I said, oh, that's such a great idea. This class changed my life. At that point, I was a leader in a Fortune 200 company, and I had uh, been applying the lessons of the class to my life for Making over big a decade. decisions. Lo making lots of big decisions. I had two kids at that point. And she, we had lunch about a year later, and I said, how is the book coming? It's so important to get this message out into the world. And she said, you know, I haven't written a word. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, maybe you need an accountability partner. And I was thinking about the fact that at the time I had just launched the first employee resource group for working parents at my employer. And I did that with a, a partner, a working dad on the legal team. 
And that was so instrumental to that success. And so she looked at me and she said, oh, that's a great idea, but I need more than that. I need a co-author and you would be the perfect person to write this book with me because you have been putting the lessons of this class to work in the trenches for over a decade. And so in that moment, I said yes. And I violated one of our principles of our book, which is never to make big life decisions in an instant. Uh, but, you know, it was it was not an a uh, an uninformed decision. I had known her. We had known each other for over a decade. I knew how much the class changed my life. And it has been the best decision to collaborate in this way and to bring the message and the material of the book to many more people than would have been able to study with her directly at Stanford. Of course, there's there's a there's a greater mission in terms of the number of people that you can reach and you can impact. And I really try and optimize when it comes to the different guests I've had over the last three years. If I am having an academic that studied at a, a prestigious university and taught a prestigious university, I love the actionable side of things as well, because sometimes, and this is not applicable to, to, to every university professor, but there's a tendency towards the theory in the books. But the people that would listen to this for an hour a week, they want to come and do something different off the back of it. They want to be like, oh, I was listening to that podcast with Abby and Colin and Abby mentioned this and I can actively do this and that's what excites people rather than potentially doing a master's in 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 in, in whatever particular subject if, if they really are just looking for one or two things that they can take away from the the commute that they spend or when they're listening to us on their on their walk or in the gym this week absolutely and and my co-author is not an academic in the ivory tower sense she actually started teaching the class born out of her own life experience where she was a PhD in economics from MIT and started teaching in Berkeley and was put on a non-tenure track position. And she had two colleagues from her PhD program who had been offered tenure track positions. And so she went to her dean and she said, hey, I just noticed this. What? Why am I in a, a lecturer role? And he said, well, it's because you live in Palo Alto. And she said, wait, what? I didn't realize I had to live in the city where I teach in order to get tenure. But obviously that was, you know, not the right, not the direct answer. And she did follow up and it was because she was a young mom. She had two kids and she lived in the city where her husband was uh, at the medical school. And so, you know, she then started teaching a class to examine the biases that exist around women in the workplace. And that class evolved into the class that was called work and family. Um, it was called Women and Work at first, and then uh, an intrepid man took it and he said, you know, this is relevant to so many people, not just women. And if you would change the name of the course to something like Work and Family, I will personally recruit more men for the class. So she did and he did. And by the time Ross and I took it, there were 40 percent men in the class. And it was absolutely a um, rich and diverse set of perspectives of the students. And we were all interested in it for our own lives, but also because we were intending to be managers of others who were um, intending to, to combine work and family. And so there were so many uh, practical applications of the course material. It was absolutely one of the most useful classes that I took now 15 years later. I think about it so often and not just because I wrote a book about it. Of course, yeah, it's, it's something that forms the, the very basis of so many things that we do day to day as well. You were mentioning during your 20s pre doing this particular course that you you fumbled your way through different decisions or you made some some big, big decisions. What were some of those big decisions that stand out for you? Yeah, well, I, I grew up on the East Coast uh, of the United States and I, I went to college on the East Coast and I really wanted to live on the West Coast. We had visited um, some cousins when I was in eighth grade, I think, and uh, I just was fell in love with California. And after I graduated, I um, didn't have a job. I was trying to, you know, I had an idea of what I wanted to do. But, you know, I, I had planned to do a, a bike trip, actually, um, a charity ride for Habitat for Humanity across the US the summer after I graduated. And so, so I thought, okay, I will focus on fundraising for this ride and training. And then after that, I'll get a job. And the ride took me out to the West Coast. We ended in Seattle. And I thought, well, maybe I should just stay on the West Coast and um, find a job there. But part of me said, well, that's really irresponsible. You know, you aren't going to have a paycheck to pay your rent. And I had some savings, but I had, you know, because I'd worked through university. But, um, you know, it was a really tough decision. And I had a friend at the time who said, well, yeah, you could move home and try to apply to jobs, but don't you think that would make you unhappy living with your parents and trying to apply to jobs across the country? And I said, 
yeah, that's a good point. So I thought, okay, I'll give myself four months and I'll find a part-time job. And if I, you know, apply to jobs and I don't find something after four months, you know, then I'll reevaluate. And so fortunately I did find a wonderful job, but it was a very nerve wracking thing to write those rent checks, feeling like, I don't know, you know, when the next paycheck uh, from a, from a full-time job is going to come my way. And, and again, that was, nobody teaches you how to make these decisions. You, you sort of see what your parents have done, what your friends are doing, but there are no courses about how to approach big life decisions. And that's, you know, that was just one example. There were certainly many more that I made, but um, it was sort of like it worked out because I found that job. But if it hadn't, would I have beaten myself up for that decision? And so part of the reason we wrote the book and have a framework for people to approach these big life decisions is so that, so that they can let themselves off the hook. Because we know that so many times life throws curve balls at us and things don't work out perfectly. But if you follow an approach that is research-based, that is trusted, that is sturdy, but flexible, it will Will give you more confidence in the decision, even if it doesn't work out perfectly in the end. I was going to say we all have uh, an outcome bias. So if, for example, you make what on the face of it seems like a great decision, but the outcome is poor, then of course we kind of berate or disparage that particular decision. But equally, we might make a bit of a rash decision and luck may play its role. And we end up with a great outcome. And then we think, oh, well, maybe that decision wasn't so bad. And actually it was the, it was the right thing. So removing necessarily the, the purely focusing on what is the result side of things is probably quite an important start point. Absolutely. And I was just talking yesterday with Annie Duke, who wrote um, a number of books on decision making. And um, we were talking about that, about how having a process that you that you go through ahead of time. And she was saying lovely things about our book. Um, it'll come out if you follow her on her sub stack, we can read about it in an upcoming newsletter. But um, this idea of um, conflating the process and the outcome is so um we, so many of us do it and it is absolutely not the right approach. Yeah. I, I love Annie's work as well. I, 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 I think it's always interesting when somebody comes from like a, a poker background like that and then relates it into, into the, into the day to day. So no, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing the, the two of you collaborate before we dive into your framework, Abby, I'd really like to know what are some of the common mistakes that people make when it comes to decision-making one of them potentially is attaching everything to the outcome, but what other ones stand out for you? Yeah, another big one is making a decision too quickly. So we as humans do not like to be uncomfortable, right? We do a lot so that we could avoid discomfort and pain. And when you're in the throes of a big life decision, it's stressful. You might feel um, guilty. You might feel uh, frustrated. You might feel angry. You might feel and any, any number of negative emotions or that we assign negativity to in, in our um, culture. And part of what we want to do is just get that decision over with, like get it off our plate, get to the other side. It almost doesn't even matter what we decide. We just don't want to be in that throes of that uncertainty anymore. And so really slowing down and not making decisions in an instant is certainly advice that we think is sound. And that's one of the reasons we developed our framework to give people a process and the rocks that they can turn over so that it slows them down. They realize, oh, okay, I, I need to get out of what Michael, what Daniel Kahneman calls system one thinking, which is our very quick, uh, emotional, impulsive decision making and into system two thinking, which is the deliberate, rational, logical decision making that leads to outcomes we feel more confident about. One of the reasons that your your book and your work spoke so much to me is whenever I've done any form of personality testing, either in work with my corporate career or through reading books, and I was lucky to host um, Thomas Erickson, who wrote Surrounded by Idiots, and it's all based on the DISC personality system. And for those that have done that, I am very red-blue. Now, red is very action, quick, fast, so would fall into that perhaps uh, camp Abbey of taking action too quickly. But then the blue is actually, I, I do appreciate data. So I'm always willing to change task or uh, change opinion or process or whatever if I'm presented with the data. And then once I get that information, I'm hell for leather. I'm go, 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 go in terms of the red side. So what I love about your framework is it provides me with that analytical side of my personality, which I can light up in terms of the blue. And then once I have that information, it's just action, 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 action. And then a little bit of a detachment from the outcome as, as we were speaking about, because I can just go back to the process and be like, wait, what did I maybe not apply as well as the process would enable me to do? And what did I not do properly? Or what did I not do correctly? And then I can rinse and repeat and go again. Well, it's so 
fabulous that you have that self-awareness and that you apply, you know, what you know about your personality to your decision-making. There are, we all have an innate decision-making bias. There are people who are very quick to trust their gut and jump into action. And then there are people on the other side of the spectrum who are real analyzers and who like to look at things from all angles. They make spreadsheets about every decision. And we have actually a quiz on our website that's kind of fun that helps you discern your particular money and love decision-making style. And what is challenging for those analyzers is that they can tip into analysis paralysis and actually never make a decision because they're still gathering all the data that they want in order to make that decision. Well, we never have perfect information. We don't have a crystal ball about what those outcomes will be. We can only provide our best guess at a given moment. And so for, and then there are folks in between, obviously, and, but for anyone along the decision-making spectrum, having a framework can be so helpful because it lets you guard against those innate biases that you have. And so if you know that you're an action oriented person who is quick and can be somewhat impulsive, sometimes the framework might help you slow down. But you're if you're a very analytical person that is loves all the information, the framework can actually move you through the process and help you get unstuck from a place where you might be spinning and over analyzing uh, in order to push you to make a decision more quickly than you might ordinarily do. Absolutely. I think, as you say, self-awareness is a bit of a superpower. So understanding that and then using the parts of the framework which allow you to get the best possible um, process moving forward. And we've got a term in in Scotland where I'm from and my parents used to say don't bringe and to bringe is to do something very very quickly and impulsively and that was kind of me when I was growing up I was, I was a bit I was a bringer I would I would I, I would uh, charge into things very very quickly but having kind of worked on my personality and self-developed myself overall I'm more able to to be a bit more patient nowadays and, and, and make decisions based on the information that um that's presented to me but I like just, that term I'm going to borrow it and use it with my kids <laughs> yes yes don't bringe bringe uh, we've got lots of beautiful little, little terms in, in in Scotland we've got our own little version of the English language but uh, finally before we go into the, the the five c's of your framework why were money and love the two particular topics that you focus on in terms of areas to make decisions within well, there are two enormous areas of our life that you need in order to thrive. I think it was Freud who said, you know, money and love are um, love and money. Those are the um, backbones of, of living, right? And so I think that's not the quote at all, but it's something like that. <laughs> we <laughs> paraphrased. Yes, creative license. Uh, but it's absolutely this um, notion that they should be separate that causes so many problems. And we really, you know, tend to be much more practical when we think about money. And when we think about love, it, we really like to dream. And we really want to keep that separate from the practicality. But the truth of the matter is, as I said, they are so intertwined. And really, we are able to make such more holistic, more fulfilling, more meaningful decisions when we bring them together. And, and so you, you really, it's life is not worth living uh, without love and you need money in order to live. And so it is really um, those two essentials that we, uh, that we cover and that we believe are at the heart of all of life's biggest decisions. I agree. They're huge topics and it's certainly why your book stood out to me and why I was so keen to, to share your wisdom with the, the audience as well. But the, the first C within your framework is, is, is clarity, Abby. So how can people go about getting clarity when they're in the decision making process? Yeah, it's absolutely about having clarity and clarifying what is most important to you. And it sounds relatively simple, but it is much more complex because our wants, our desires are so powerfully influenced by what other people want. So there is a term uh, French philosopher René Girard coined called mimetic desire. And if you are happy renting a flat and you see all your friends starting to buy uh, their homes, you might start feeling like you should be buying a home. You, should, you might be feeling behind because everyone else is doing that. That might not be what you want, but you are going to be so influenced by seeing all those pictures on Instagram of friends holding keys in front of sold signs and, um, and it can be really challenging. So one way to do that is to get very clear about your core values. There are lots of exercises you can find on the internet about you know, sorting values and identifying ones that are important to you. Another exercise I like is about identifying peak experiences. So what were those moments that you felt the most you, that you were in flow, that time seems to melt away and you just are so focused on the moment. Um, and then you start to put a few of those together and you see what are the patterns, what are the common themes. Those are 
clues as to what's important to you. And then another way is to pay attention to the things that you feel very strongly about, that you have emotional reactions to when you maybe read a story uh, in the media about them or you know see something in the news. Those those outsized emotional reactions where you're so frustrated about something or so indignant or, you know, so thrilled, those are, again, because it's touching a nerve that is connected to a core value. And so you can start to get these clues about what's important to you. Um, but it really requires a lot of self-reflection, a lot of um, getting quiet. So I think it was why COVID was a, such a clarifying moment for so many of us when we our commutes went away, some of the distractions that kept us really busy and not really able to think about what's important to us went away. And then suddenly, you know, we had these um, pockets of moments that weren't available to us before in which to do that reflection. And many of us didn't like what we saw. That's so true. So many people pivoted during that period, whether it was career or, or in their love life or, in, or how they spend their money or how they spend their time. I do think there's a there's also an element some people really hate that level of quiet and that reflection and there's an element of like sedating yourself and one of the things I've kind of I kind of try and rally against in the podcast is living life on autopilot whether that's going to a job that you hate and sedating yourself with hours of Netflix and fast food at night afterwards and crawling out your bed the next day and dragging yourself on that on, on that commute that you, you, you hate so much or whether it's at the weekend turning to drink drugs or gambling or something to kind of seek some sort of hedonic pleasure in a life of a kind of a, a mundane experience but I think when you do have that period of quietness there is an element of it can be painful I think you were saying some people don't like what they see and that sometimes is the almost the trigger moment that change it for, almost forces change upon you if you can get that level of clarity about how you truly feel rather than not how you feel in a state of a uh, frenzy or panic as you were as you were or you were describing in terms of our lifestyle pre c19 then it, it gives you the opportunity for more clear decision making as you were saying yeah and to welcome those moments again we don't like to feel discomfort we don't like to say oh i don't like that part of my life but those are gifts those are opportunities to take a closer look and to do something differently and you know i think the other reason the pandemic was so clarifying is we realized we only get one life and we are not guaranteed about how long it's going to be and so all of the people that we lost and the um, opportunities to see friends that we lost during that time those aren't coming again. And so I, I would say instead of pushing that away and just saying, oh, but I'm so happy I can get back to travel and all the things that keep me busy. And so I don't have to look at my life, welcome them in and see them as a sign that you can do something differently and make a change. I'm a big fan of checking in on myself on a pretty regular basis. And I've journaled for just over three years now, which is kind of similar in line in terms of when I started the podcast as well, which again was in the kind of first or second week of lockdown in 2020 in the UK. And by checking in on myself quite regularly, I can give myself clarity of how happy I am with the activities that I've conducted that day in terms of how I've held myself, how I've spent my time, how I've aligned my energy, how I've made others feel around me as well. And if you told that to Colin four years ago the, the the gym bro working in insurance sales and trying to do big deals in his blue suit and his black shoes I think I would be less likely to have listened but the podcast has certainly opened my mind getting to speak to individuals like yourself and some of the other fantastic guests that I've had it gives you the opportunity to be open-minded to experiences like regularly journaling and writing out how you particularly feel about some of the experiences that you're having and by doing that, it's actually quite difficult to live a misaligned life because it would regularly show up in my writings and entries that I was doing something that made me feel wrong or uh, misdirected. That's so true. I have been a journaler since I was nine years old. And so I absolutely agree. Uh, it's very hard to hide from yourself, especially when you do it uh, with some consistency. So I yeah, think that's not, a great I've suggestion. Not... I've not clocked the same number of reps, but I can certainly speak to um, the last three years have been have been fantastic from from that regard. And I, I really do think, as you say, if what I was writing was actually like unpleasant or challenging, and don't get me wrong, there's been times over the years where I've maybe like, reflected on things and been like that was wrong, that that could have been done better. That's been really helpful because I've then I've then changed, I've then made a m m made an amendment. And as you say, you might look in the mirror and not like what you see during the during the quietness. That's fantastic because that's can that that can preempt change. One of the big points you made was around um, uh, mimetic desire was the term that you used. It's very easy to get swept away by 
society's expectations of us. And some things I can certainly understand, like traditionally, there's a reason things have been the way they've been for a number of years in terms of it works from an evolutionary standpoint or whatever we want to talk about, but necessarily maybe getting on the, the, the property ladder or buying the particular car that everyone your age is getting or, oh, like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm 30 and I'm not married and I'm not, I've, I've not got kids, but some of the people around me are getting engaged and having kids as well. So there is always pressure to conform in that regard, but knowing what you want to want in that regard is really, really a bit of a superpower, not necessarily getting swept along by the tide. It's so true. And I think social media has only amplified that, right? You might have known previously about friends and gone to certain weddings, but now you can scroll endlessly and see, you know, all of these engagement videos and all of these gender reveal videos, right? And so it feels like you are even more alone in your different choice, right? Um, which is just not the case. I mean, those things were always there. They just weren't served up to us with the perfect TikTok algorithm to make us, you know, stay there. So um, I, I think it's absolutely true that mimetic desire is so powerful. It's not only what our peers are doing, it's what our parents want for us, what our teachers suggest that we should do. And so it takes a lot of self-knowledge and a lot of willpower actually to be able to go against those conventional choices. And especially if you're a, a high achieving, ambitious person, you might find a lot of boxes on that life list that you feel like you should be checking off without taking a moment and examining who, how did that get on the list? Did I put that there or did that just get on the list because it's the thing that somebody says you should be doing in your thirties? That's such, that's such a good point. Did the items that you're trying to take off the goals that you're trying to hit did you put them on the list or did they just become ad hoc as a as a requirement to, to to fit in so no I find that clarity piece fascinating and you mentioned social media there I think kind of combining periods where you unplug and detach as well as periods where you have quiet and you journal or maybe you go walk without any music or anything like that and that was something that one of my previous guests, Sahil Bloom, who I was a big fan of his short form content on Twitter, and I was intrigued to speak to him on the podcast. And he was saying that so many of his threads and his emails that he writes, he writes them into a little notebook that he takes on his walks with him. Because when you unplug from, now don't get me wrong, I'd love you all to be listening to a self-development podcast in your AirPods every time you go <laughs> a walk, and that'd be, that'd be great for me. But having those moments where you unplug from any input, whether that's music, podcasts, or conversations, sometimes your thoughts just are much more forthcoming and you're much more creative. And I'm sure you can maybe tell us about the creative process behind writing a, a book, Abby, but being unplugged and having your mind run free can be such a powerful experience when it comes to clarity, but also kind of um, thoughts ruminating and kind of spilling forth. Absolutely. And, you know, for me, it's in nature. One of the reasons I live in Northern California and in the, in the San Francisco Bay area is because it is so easy to get into nature and especially during COVID, that was one of the few things that you could do that was just easy um, to go on hikes. And, you know, I, we're going to talk about the second step, which is to communicate. But I find nature very conducive to both clarifying what I want and then communicating with the other person or people who are part of the decision. There's something about getting out of the chaos of your day-to-day -day life, the dishes piled in the sink, the laundry that needs to be folded and being in a more expansive place helps you think more expansively. So I always recommend going on a hike, trying to even just go to a, a place that's not as um, sensory overload. I'm particularly noise sensitive. And so just going into some place that is quiet, as you said, without the inputs that you're creating or even that the world is creating can help you access more of that deep self-knowledge that might not be at the surface. Yeah, great points. Having great recommendations, but you mentioned the the second C is is, is communicate to play um, devil's advocate. Why would you need to communicate with somebody else about a decision that you personally need to make? Because we are not living in a vacuum. Any decision that you are making personally, even if you are not married or with a partner, uh, is going to have an effect on other people who are important to you. And so, it's something that is so. Uh, critical to do is to bring someone else into the decision to talk about what you are, what's on your mind, first of all. And um, so often we think about when we talk to someone else about making a big life decision, what we're going to say, right? We, we are over index on the exact points we want to make. And the communication step is just as much, if not more, about listening to what the other person then responds. And you've done all this clarification. You share what you're thinking. You need to give them an opportunity to react, to share their own perspective. And we often just spring this on people, right? We, we 
come, we say, oh, I hate this job. It's driving me crazy. I need to quit. I'm just going to go into my colleague's office and tell them, okay, I'm quitting today. And they might be in the middle of a really important uh, report or something that they can't be distracted by. So just as you would make an appointment with your boss to um, talk to them about something, make an appointment with your partner, make an appointment with your parents, make an appointment with, you know, someone who you want to bring into the decision so that you're not just bringing it onto them at a terrible time. Um, my husband and I had this bad habit before we started um, researching and writing the book of, of having these conversations um, as we're like brushing our teeth, getting ready for bed at night, right? Which is just the worst time to do it because then you're trying to fall asleep and this, you know, big conversation is swirling and you're tired. And so we say, you know, don't just blurt it out the second that, you know, a big decision comes into your head make an appointment, make sure it's a good time for them. Um, when my husband and I were talking about potentially moving, we would bring that up again at these odd times. And so finally, having you know done enough research to say that's not a way to effectively communicate, we said, okay, let's talk about this next weekend when we're on our hike, we'll let the kids run up ahead and you and I can have a conversation about this, but let's agree not to bring it up before then. So we're then not gonna bring it up at an inconvenient time where someone is not prepared. And that was a very helpful practice that let us uh, communicate more effectively. Yeah, the, the fact that it's not just what we're communicating, but where and in what setting and what mindset that both people are in is is such a good recommendation. Because as you say, if you bring it up when you're maybe maybe he's doing the dishes or you're brushing your teeth and you're just not ready to have a conversation that's maybe of a particular seriousness of a particular level. And if you feel ambushed, you're much more likely, as you said, if you rushed into your colleague's office when they're up against it with a deadline they maybe feel ambushed or like interrupted in the same way that if you get a get a cold call during a during the day when maybe you're writing your writing your next book Abby you're less likely to take the 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 sales opportunity that somebody's presenting to you even though it might be a brilliant opportunity that's really like in line with a purchase that you're ready to make and it's just come at the wrong time it's just come in the wrong uh, wrong level and the wrong wrong energy for you absolutely and and we you know we are so used to distractions right we have this giant distraction we carry with us at all times, you know, our phones. And, and so there is something about giving this conversation, the space and the respect that it deserves by not ambushing someone by um, carving out the dedicated time so that you can both talk about it. And so as you know, back to your question about why you should bring someone else in, um, because the, the worst thing you could do is to um, present someone with a completely uh, made up, you know, you've already made up your mind, you've, you've thought through all the angles, and then you say, you know, I've decided I'm moving, or I'm quitting. And that person who is very much going to be affected by the decision says, well, where's the space for me to, you know, share what I think, and this affects me too. And, you know, really it's honoring your relationship, which again, we know relationships are so key to happiness. And so even if it's not someone you're dating, even if it's, you know, again, your parents and you're planning to move, giving them the um, opportunity to share their perspective is really important because it's, it's honoring that relationship that you have with them. Yeah. It makes, makes a lot of sense to me from a communication perspective. Is there a particular way to phrase uh, like where you're at in a particular situation to like broach a conversation with that because I, I'm thinking if we're talking about subjects like money and love quite evocative emotional subjects and I know we're saying money sometimes can be quite right-headed and regimented but we know that it has massive excitatory power in terms of like if people are thinking about money and it's probably one of the greatest stresses that we have in our life when things are going wrong with money how can we communicate or maybe position that when we're having a conversation do you have any tips Abby? Well, I think the important thing is to tread lightly, right? These are, as you mentioned, really charged topics. They're also taboo, right? We don't have great models in our society for talking about money. We um, tend to be very vulnerable when it comes to both money and love topics. And so the first thing is just to recognize that this is a big conversation. It's totally normal if you're having emotional reactions to having it, um, but to have it before you feel ready. And, you know, one of the things, again, that I think was so such a um, serendipitous uh, experience was in the class that I mentioned, Ross and I were making decisions about whether or not to move in together. And Myra had shared this piece of data, which is that couples that live together before they get married have higher divorce rates. And that was really counterintuitive to us. It was surprising. And we had to write a final paper. So we said, okay, well, maybe we should dig into this because it's something that we were actively talking about. 
And we, again, because we were writing this paper, had to have a lot of these conversations and we did the research. And it that actually took a lot of the... Um, I don't know. It was it was like we had permission to talk about this. It was it wasn't. It was still scary, and it was still with the image we like to use is that you're standing at the top of a high diving board, and so you have that feeling in your stomach of like, oh my gosh, I don't. This is really nerve wracking. But the diving board isn't getting any lower. So there's an element of you know just force yourself to have the conversation to talk with the person who you is important to you, and to tread lightly because it's likely going to be a difficult topic for them too. And, and don't expect to resolve it in one conversation. That's the other thing about the communication is an ongoing process. The framework, even though there are five C's and it sounds very linear, is a very iterative process. And so you clarify, then you communicate, then the other person shares what their perspective is that might actually cause you to re-clarify. And so we say clarify and communicate are a bit of a dance that you are doing with this other person and just be okay dancing for a while. It might, it might not be that you have a 30 minute conversation and it's all resolved and that's okay. Agreed. That's that around couples having a higher divorce rate when they've lived together before. It, it kind of flies in the face of the logic of, oh, it'd be good to like try things out and see how each other are before we, before we move in and get in, and, and, and get married in the future. And um, how can you overcome something like that? Well, so the answer, which we discovered in our paper, is that there is a way to overcome that, and it is by being intentional. So if you go into the relationship with both people sharing, you know, this is my hope for where this relationship is headed. If one person thinks they're just going to save on rent and the other person thinks that they're headed towards marriage, that's a recipe for disaster. But if you're intentional about why you're doing this, about how you're going to combine your lives, your careers, your uh, household chores, uh, all of financial uh, matters, all of those things, if you are intentional and have a deliberate approach, then the negative effects go away. It's when you slide into the decision rather than decide that you get those uh, experiences where people are suddenly in a relationship that is almost as hard to dissolve as a marriage, right? Because you're already, you know, sharing a space, you're so um, integrated, so integrated, and you don't, but you haven't had any of those conversations to talk about how you're going to do it when the challenge that is that is when the very challenging situations arise. The word slide was a great image there for me. Like I can see how, oh, my, my girlfriend comes and stays over on the weekend. Um, she's got a key to let herself in because I'm not back from whatever I'm doing on the Saturday yet. And then it, that slides into staying for longer periods and longer periods. Oh, she's got a drawer in the, in, the, in the bedroom. Her stuff's in the bathroom. Oh, it just so happens now that she's staying every week. Oh, great. Her lease is up on her flat. Now, 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 she, now she's moving in here. And that is like unconsciously sliding into a situation that you both haven't had a proper conversation and haven't made a clear decision on. So I, I love that we've, uh, we've, we've brought that to light in that regard. And I'm glad your intentionality meant that you and Ross has worked out for so well. Um, the, the third C is, is, is choices. Abby, talk to me about that. Yeah. So it's about considering a broad range of choices because when we are in the throes of a big decision, we get tunnel vision and we see the extremes. We see, you know, do I marry this person or break up with them? Or do I go for the promotion or do I quit the job? And those, there are so many options in between those two extremes, but it is very hard for us to see them when we are in that heightened emotional state. And so it's really about expanding the consideration set putting more options on the table that are creative, that might let you get at what is important to you without the extremes that you initially see at first blush. And so, um, you know, the, the third C uh, goes with the fourth C, which is to check in with friends, family, and trusted resources. Because by checking in, by getting that outside perspective of someone who is not in the thick of the decision and therefore has a different uh, reference than you. They're not seeing those two extremes. They might say, well, you know, Colin, you don't have to just marry this person or break up with them. What about, you know, have you gone on a trip together? Like, how did that go? Like, have you stress tested your relationship? Have you, um, you know, it was, <laughs> I was just talking about this experience that I had when Ross and I first started dating and we had been friends for a while. So I knew that the relationship was going to get serious very quickly. And I, I talked to a friend who knew both of us and I said, I just don't know if I'm willing to commit, if I'm ready to do that right now. And she said, well, you're not deciding if you're going to get married right now, give it a month, like see how it goes. Um, 
And if it goes well, then, you know, give it another month. You're not. Uh, and, and so it was this like probationary period that I had, you know, decided in my head. And it was funny because we had planned to take a trip together. We went away for the 4th of July uh, holiday in the U.S. And we uh, that was at the end of the probation. And I remember waking up that morning and just thinking, oh, this ma past month has been amazing. There are like, this was such a great uh, time. And so I said to him, like, here are all the great things that I love about this relationship and that, you know, I really enjoy about the past month. And he was like, I mean, thanks, but where is this coming from? Like, he had no idea he was on probation, but, you know, because my friend had given me this idea of trying it on for size for a month, that would, that helped me access uh, a an easier way of being in that decision than the one that I was initially seeing. I, I really, really like that. Re regarding all things choices, I feel like in the information economy that we live in, we're almost bombarded with more choices than ever before. And we have so many different options available to us. Is there a way that we can rally against the fact that there's just so many different opportunities and avenues that we can go down when it maybe comes to money, when it comes to love, when it comes to career, we are kind of inundated. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, and we can we can go back to this, but this gets at the fifth C, which is consequences. And that's really about trying to um, project into the future what the outcome of the decision will be. And so one way to try to eliminate choices is to try them on for size, to create experiments, to do prototyping, as they say in the design thinking world, so that you get some information about a choice without actually making it. So if you're interested in working at a company, but you're, you're not sure about its culture, you could talk to people who work there, you could talk to people who have left, you could try to do a project for that company, you could do an internship, right? So there are lots of different ways to get at what would this choice be like? And then you might, you know, talk to three people who have left that company and say, oh, you know, all of the shiny marketing on the website is really, you know, it turns out it's pretty toxic at that place. I'm going to cross that company off the list. And that's a way to start eliminating choices because you've gotten more information about them. That's a huge, that's a huge, huge point. Because like, if I'm thinking even from like a love perspective, we didn't have dating apps the way that we do now, even, even 10 years ago, we didn't have Instagram and social media where I know that you can, you can, connect with so many different people from so many different areas that previously you wouldn't have had the same opportunity to you would maybe limited to your class at college or your class at university or the people in your village or your town and there's a there's a lot of kind of almost shiny object syndrome in that regard it's true. Well, dating is its own particular subject because there is research by a professor another professor at Stanford a marketing professor named Baba Shiv who talks about sequential choice versus simultaneous choice. And so simultaneous choice or sequential choice rather is what the dating apps offer, right? It's like, there's always another person you can swipe and see. And it sort of seems like, you know, this eternal quest for the best. There is always somebody who could be better, a more perfect match for you if you just, you know, continue to swipe. And that's what the apps are designed to get you to do because they want you to keep paying the subscription fee and so on. But uh, Baba Shiv is from India and his uh, marriage, when he was ready to get married, they had a practice um, in his family and his culture of uh, arranged marriage. And so he told his parents, they presented him with three potential uh, partners. And he then within a set period of time, met with each of them, picked the one that he felt, you know, was best aligned with him. And now they've been married for decades. And so he talks, he's done a lot of experiments in, you know, other areas besides dating, but he talks about dating as this very powerful place where uh, simultaneous choice, again, choosing through a, about a fixed op, uh, set of options in a set time horizon is uh, much more likely to lead to satisfaction than the people who are always swiping and searching for the next potential mate. I need and to so... narrow it down to three, Abby. Okay, I'll I'll, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll tell my mom the good news. Abby's given me some advice. Some advice. You went, you went. I'll, I'll end up with somebody serious soon. I'll, uh, I'll calm down and I'll, I'll, I'll choose some three, three very good options, and I'll, I'll do that thorough assessment. I mean, you can you can apply the principles of it without actually going to a matchmaker, but just say, OK, you know, for the next whatever it is, six months or a year, I'm going to meet as, you know, however many people you have the tolerance to meet. You, you seem pretty extroverted, so maybe it's higher than others, um, but but say, OK, and, you know, that's that's the, the set that I'm going to be choosing between. It's not that I, you know, continue to do this for 10 years because I always feel like there could be somebody better around the corner. 
we were talking before we went into your framework around detaching the outcome from the quality of our 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 our, our choice and i just want to to revisit that that briefly as well because it's it's so easy to kind of fall back on that choice was a good choice because it worked out well, whereas that was a bad choice because it didn't work out well. And by looking back at some of the, the seas that we've covered already, you can see already that if you've got this framework in place, we're sort of removing some of that emotional attachment to the the outcome of our choice and moving forward in a in a way that's slightly more process and reg not regimented, but more um, like understood. Structured. Yeah. Structured. Great term. Yeah, I think that's right. And I think if you, I mean, I think the first C, the clarify step is the hardest, but once you do that, it makes all the other C's flow more easily because you are so clear on what you're seeking. And therefore that will help you narrow your set of choices that will help you um, figure out who to check in with. Uh, and so again, it sort of, you, you do that work at the front end and then it really helps you all the way through. When you were uh, advised to do the one month probation period, that was a, a, a an almost an element of of checking in. How do you choose who you check in with? Because of course you need to communicate as a second C with the people that are going to be affected by the decision. But if we just choose to just check in with, and maybe it's a British phrase, any Tom, Dick, or Harry, or any random in the in the street, then maybe we we do start to create paralysis by analysis because we're seeking opinions and um, thoughts from just everyone and anyone. How do we whittle down the people that we almost have within our trusted little circle? It's a great question because the analyzers definitely like to have a long list of check-ins uh, and, and it really just depends on the type of decision. So there is research that says when you are looking for a new job, for example, that weak ties, people who are your you know second and third degree connections on LinkedIn are um, going to have access to information that people in your immediate network don't. And so it's, it's actually important to check in with a broader variety of people about what you're looking for and um, see what opportunities they know about. But for more personal decisions, decisions like uh, whether to have a child, when to have another child, those are very deeply personal decisions. Those other people are going to uh, give you their perspective and they're not going to raise that child with you. And so uh, it's important to, first of all, determine what type of decision it is and, and if it would benefit from a broader range or a, a smaller range. And then, you know, for example, if you're thinking about uh, if the person you're dating is the one for you that you want to spend your life with, uh, think about people whose relationships you admire. Think about the people who have had long relationships that have stood the test of time. And rather than say, what do you think that is this person the one I should marry? Um, say, help me understand how you thought about the decision to spend your life with your partner. What were the things you asked yourself? What were the questions that you sought answers to? So you're really trying to understand their approach as opposed to asking for direct advice. And there is it's a difference because um, it's not about, and I, you know, sometimes people say, well, I'm, I know what my parents are going to say. You know, I know that the aunt who has a lot of opinions, like I can already hear her. So I say, well, don't ask them then, <laughs> you know, you can be very selective with your check-ins because you need to filter that through the advice that is going to be meaningful to you. And if you have a neighbor or a relative or someone who gives a lot of unsolicited advice, you don't have to go there. They might offer it anyway. And you can just say, thank you so you much for your opinion. You can filter it out. You can exactly. absolutely filter it. Ex 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 exactly that. And I guess it's a case of striking the balance between going it alone and not being over reliant on the opinions of others. And you can insert that whole daft Instagram quote that you see, a lion doesn't lose a p uh, sleep over the opinions of sheep or whatever else you want to say. But it's very important that we are selective of who we dive into. And I found it very helpful that you said, for example, for maybe work decisions, it can be helpful to tap into people that are slightly detached. And I do know from, from a money perspective, it can be helpful to tap into somebody that's maybe a, a professional financial advisor who doesn't have the same emotional connection to you as your family members because they might make different decisions to somebody who has a calm, rational analysis of just looking at the figures and the projections and whatever else. And it, whereas sometimes your family, and it, I, I certainly come from a family where the financial decisions in terms of investments is, would be like conservative with a small C. So like very like safe, very calm, very measured. Whereas if I told them that a third of my portfolio was in Bitcoin and crypto, they would be like, oh, that's a bit, that's a, that's a bit risky. But because of my understanding of that, I'm much more comfortable with that and the different people that I check in with in that space. So I do find it funny that 
yes, it's so important to have the people that are affected by your decisions involved, but the check-in element, you can sometimes use less, like more impartial advisors. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we are big fans of third-party experts, whether that's a financial advisor, whether that's a therapist, whether that's, you know, just someone who is trained, a coach, um, and I've hired all three uh, at different parts in my of my life and benefited from their wisdom because they, first of all, see many more examples and are able to spot patterns and are able to be, as you said, detached from the specific situation and the outcome. So um, the check-in is, is really... Um, you know, not limited to people. Also, there's published studies. And as a, you know, my co author being a labor economist, there is a lot of research that we cite in the book where, um, and we did a big survey, actually, as part of the research for the book, and there are lots of stories. And one of the reasons we wanted to offer those is because what we saw from the, the people who responded to our survey is that it is a very stressful thing to be in the midst of a big life decision. And a lot of the people who responded said, I feel really alone in this decision, it feels very lonely. And it feels like, you know, I'm the only one facing this decision. And it actually turns out because we could see, you know, the hundreds of responses we got that there were so many people facing that same decision, say, to, you know, care for a, an aging relative. Right. But when you're in that experience, it feels like, oh, none of my friends have this obligation. But here I am. And we wanted people to know that they were not alone. And so to the extent that there are published studies or communities that they can find that they realize they have the shared experience, that is very powerful as well. That is such a good point, because um, particularly with topics like that, and I'm really glad you addressed that within your, uh, within your work as well, uh, Abby, because I think when I'm thinking about my parents in their late 60s, early 70s, the last thing you want to think about is like um, what their kind of later life experience might be like when they're less able to fend for themselves, when they're less um, self-reliant. And one of the things that I really liked about your book was that you did address topics like that where people could maybe actually have that conversation. And it's a really difficult conversation because like you say, things can happen really quickly in that space if somebody gets struck by a particular illness or disease that's particularly debilitating or they have an accident which lowers their level of dependency to a level that you're you're not used to seeing mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or whoever it is like that so i love that there's a level of productivity around that as well and i can um like be quite honest in the fact that we've we've even talked about things like inheritance and money after after things changed or the, or the family house that um, mum and dad still stay at what would happen with that in the event that one or the other had a had a challenge as well and it's and actually interestingly it was the c19 pandemic which opened their eyes to that albeit touch wood whenever they had the actual virus itself they, they, they largely shrugged it off like a like a flu because they're quite healthy and they're quite um well looked after but um, that was a, a kind of prompt for us to have slightly more serious conversations, like that kind of more um, uh, more visceral conversation that you would never normally want to have. I think it's wonderful that you've had those conversations. And yes, I think that was a silver lining of COVID for so many people is that it, it allowed us to see our own mortality and then that in many cases can prompt those conversations. Um, you know, one of the reasons we wrote the book the way we did with each chapter focusing on a different decision is that we know, I mean, we would love for people to read it cover to cover and if you're so inclined, great. But we know, and I know from taking this class that there are some decisions that seem far off, that seem like, oh, I'm not gonna have to face this, you know, ever hopefully, you know, in the case of divorce, but, but actually it turns out that half of marriages do end in divorce. And, Unfortunately, all of our parents, you know, will be no longer with us at some point. And so it is something where we want people to be able to keep it on the shelf or keep it in their Kindle uh, or their e-reader and be able to open it back up to a chapter that is relevant to them what, when maybe it didn't really absorb the first time around or they didn't actually get to it because uh, it, was, it, it was not timely for them. So, um, but in the case of conversations with uh, parents, it is absolutely helpful to do that or grandparents outside of an emergency situation. And so, you know, the worst time to have these conversations is when someone ends up in the hospital or there is an accident and you're certainly stressed and you're not thinking as clearly. And so to the extent that you can, again, have those conversations earlier than you feel ready, yes, it means acknowledging something that none of us want to face, but it will make so many things easier in the long run if you do have those conversations outside of the chaos of an emergency. It's a, it is a morbid topic, as you say, and uh, when you consider the fifth C, which is um, kind of considering the different consequences which are, which, which are possible, you are considering things like, oh, would somebody be destitute? Would somebody be um, unable to support themselves? Would somebody be um, 
financially unviable to an extent that they would need support from somebody else within the family or within the friendship group. So that kind of consider piece that unlocks some things that are a little bit scary. And I think there is an element of like not to catastrophize, but to be aware that the the worst thing can happen within that fifth C. Yes. And to think about consequences as, as positives too. I mean, that's the thing. And we have a, a negativity bias as humans. And so we automatically go to the worst case scenario, which you're right. It is helpful to think about because our minds are naturally going to go there. And sometimes, unfortunately, it does happen. But to, to also understand that things can have positive consequences and to play out those those different consequences on different time horizons, because we have a very um, short term bias as humans, right? We see the short term very clearly, we have a harder time seeing the outcomes over the medium and long term. So a lot of what we're encouraging with that step is to play out the consequences over the short term, the long term and the medium term to get over that short term bias and start to see what could go really right over the long haul and what could go really wrong and make sure you're prepared for both. I really like that you've mentioned the the longer term there because as you say, a decision might not immediately bear fruit. And if we were to look at um, you deciding to to write this particular book, it's months, years of work before the final product comes out, before you go on the podcast to talk about it, before you see the, the Amazon book sales, before you get that kind of uh, gratification and uh, understanding of the impact that it's having in terms of the message and the emails and the people that will probably speak to you off the back of this conversation say oh Abby I actually thought about uh, your your five C's and I've started to to consider these things that that is a long-term thing rather than a short-term thing because the short term is maybe the pain of the the research and the writing that some days will feel like you're you're banging your head against a brick wall Oh, absolutely. And I mean, I this book, the gestation period was definitely longer than either of my children. It was a, a multi year process. Uh, but but it was um, because I felt so strongly and knew uh, that this material was going was had helped me so much that I was willing to put in that work. And I, I actually love the research part of it. And I love the writing part of it. I love I loved every stage of it, um, especially the, the, the conversations I get to have with really interesting people like yourself. But um, I do think that we are not used to in our culture where you can now, you know, press a button on your phone and get a package, you know, within hours, uh, this idea that you need to think about the long term consequences. And certainly, you know, uh, I used to work uh, for a Fortune 200 company in the sustainability space, and thinking about, you know, these long term decisions of, um, of for our planet is just so critical, uh, the long-term implications of some of those short-term decisions like overnight shipping, like um, all the things that we've become accustomed to is really important for not just you know our, our future, our children's future, but the future of the world. As a, a final question for you, Abby, I'd love to know what is a question or decision that you think the listeners should go away and consider off the back of this podcast? Well, so the last chapter of our book, which we haven't talked about, is all about how um, you can change the systems that are the ones that are offering some of these suboptimal choices around money and love. And so I think the reason that so many of these decisions feel fraught is that our money institutions, our career institutions, are not very good on the love front. And so the more that individuals can push against those policies and the laws and the culture of our society, we can actually change a lot of those institutions for the better. And so one of one of the things that I mentioned I did was start the first employee resource group for working parents at Gap Bank. It was um, something that I, it was a very family friendly company. So we, we there were a lot of working parents there, but everyone was reinventing the wheel individually. And it was costly for the company. It was uh, lonely for the employees. And so by forming an intentional community, we were able to, um, and that was actually before COVID, it was then in place for a time when we all needed it because we were all trying to care for our children and, you know, zoom in in the same space at the same time, which, as we know, was, was very challenging for those of us who were faced with that. Um, and so this idea that everyone has the opportunity to be what we call a tempered radical, which is somebody who makes change from the inside. We're not talking about, you know, marching in the streets and picking up a bullhorn, but think about the institutions that you're connected to. It could be your place of work. It could be um, a place that you worship. It could be a community institution, it could be a alma mater, but pay attention to what are the, the experiences. And we have a, a list in the book, each chapter has exercises for people to um, fill out. So it's very practical, but pay attention to the things that you feel like could be improved. And then think about how you might play a role because it is only by 
individuals uh, exerting, pushing against those systems that things are going to change for the better. And we believe that it's possible that anyone can be a change agent. Absolutely, Abby. I think that's a, a powerful and empowering note for us to wrap up on. And I did say final question, but my final question is, if people would like to continue the conversation with you, where should they head towards? So they can go to our book website, which is moneylovebook.com. And you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm Abby Davison there and on Instagram at, at abby.davison. Perfect, Abby. Both of those, or all three of those, sorry, will be linked in the show notes below. And thank you to you, the listener, for joining us as well. And I'll be back to speak to you all again very, very soon.